This is the fourth video in a series on protein needs and disease states. It explores how critical illness affects protein turnover, and it provides recommendations for intake. Now that we've covered the basics of protein turnover, the RDA, and recommendations for older adults, cirrhosis, chronic kidney disease, and pressure injuries, we're going to explore the protein needs with critical illness. Once again, the intent won't be to provide a comprehensive overview of the condition. It's really just to outline how protein turnover is affected and discuss the current view on the recommended intake. Unlike the previous conditions that we've covered, where there's a distinct definition and set of characteristics, critical illness is a bit more abstract. This is because it isn't one condition. Instead, it can be any acute condition that requires the support of vital organ functions to prevent imminent death. Thus, patients in an ICU are a diverse population, but all have an urgent need for more advanced technological support and closer monitoring than their non-ICU counterparts. According to data from the Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, the top five reasons patients are admitted to an ICU are respiratory failure with the need for mechanical ventilation, myocardial infarction, stroke, percutaneous cardiovascular procedures, and sepsis. Other forms of critical illness include trauma, burns, and complicated surgery. Then within all of the etiologies, there's a wide range of severity. With this in mind, we're discussing critical illness as a general concept. The following section on metabolism may not represent every patient that you find in an ICU, but it serves as an illustration of changes that commonly occur. Regardless of etiology, critical illness contributes to a high level of physical stress on the body, and there are various physiological responses to reflect that. When it comes to protein turnover, balance is quickly tipped in favor of protein breakdown due to the activation of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as a powerful immune response. On the one hand, the fight-or-flight response is marked by an acute increase in circulating levels of cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and glucagon. These stimulate muscle protein breakdown to increase glucose availability through gluconeogenesis. Then on the other hand, the immune response is marked by an acute increase in circulating levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukins 1 and 6. These stimulate muscle protein breakdown to drive the synthesis of immune cells and positive acute phase proteins like C-reactive protein. Tied into these factors can be an overall increase in resting energy expenditure. Some of the glucose that's made available through gluconeogenesis gets used to support the metabolic demand of changes like an increased heart rate, an increased respiratory rate, and an increased body temperature. Ideally, we'd be able to satisfy this increased demand for energy through the provision of exogenous carbohydrate and fat, but there are challenges to accurately estimating energy needs. Simple weight-based calculations and predictive equations cannot consistently capture energy needs with accuracy, and the access to indirect calorimetry, which can do this, remains low. Furthermore, the risk of overfeeding patients at the height of critical illness may be equally as detrimental as underfeeding them, as it's associated with various complications. Thus, in many cases, clinicians are left in a position where the actual energy needs are unknown, some percentage of the energy requirement is satisfied through nutrition support, but an energy gap remains that causes the breakdown of skeletal muscle. Other factors to consider are decreased mobilization and anabolic resistance. Patients with critical illness are often unable to stimulate their skeletal muscle in a meaningful way, which results in muscle loss in a matter of days. This may be partly, but not fully offset through aggressive exercise interventions by members of the rehabilitation team. Anabolic resistance was discussed in detail in the first part of this series when we looked at older adults. Basically, with critical illness, a similar concept is thought to apply. 
The amount of protein required to produce an anabolic response may be higher than it is for the patient at baseline. Between the fight-or-flight response, the immune response, an increase in resting energy expenditure, a need to avoid overfeeding, decreased mobilization, and anabolic resistance, net protein breakdown can be considered an inevitable consequence of critical illness. As a result, the primary goal of protein delivery during critical illness isn't to prevent muscle loss from happening. It's just to minimize the total amount lost. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share it with a friend. All of these actions help me to reach and help more people. The leading organizations for nutrition recommendations in the setting of critical illness are the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, or ASPIN, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. These organizations have joined together in the publication of clinical guidelines both in 2016 and 2021, which nutrition professionals in the United States typically refer to as the critical care guidelines. According to the 2021 guidelines, the recommended protein intake is 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. Using the GRADE process for evaluating the quality of evidence and strength of recommendation, the authors rated the quality of evidence as low and the strength of recommendation as weak. This means that there's a lack of certainty regarding the harms and benefits of it. This recommendation of 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day is consistent with the 2016 guidelines. Nevertheless, one difference between the guidelines is that in 2016 the authors allowed for recommendations based on expert opinion and various study designs, whereas in 2021 they only featured recommendations based on randomized controlled trials. So, in the 2016 guidelines, there are three protein recommendations that don't appear in the 2021 guidelines. The three protein recommendations from the 2016 guidelines are specific to obesity, burns, and frequent hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy. For obesity, they recommend 2.0 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight per day with a BMI of 30 to 40 and up to 2.5 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight per day with a BMI that's greater than or equal to 40. Then for burns, they recommend 1.5 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. Finally, for frequent hemodialysis or continuous renal replacement therapy, they recommend up to 2.5 grams per kilogram per day. Looking at resources beyond the critical care guidelines, we can turn to the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism. In 2019, they released their own guidelines on nutrition in the ICU, and it included a protein recommendation of 1.3 grams per kilogram per day. As you can see, this falls within the recommendations from the critical care guidelines, but is on the lower end of the range. I personally prefer the range of 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day since it embraces the diversity of the population and accounts for the most severe illnesses in which protein breakdown is profound. In the end, when providing nutrition care to patients in the ICU, close attention must be paid to their unique medical conditions to determine where on the range of recommended intake they should fall. As a general rule of thumb, patients with significant burns, trauma, sepsis, malnutrition, and concurrent medical conditions that increase protein needs will be most likely to benefit from the highest amount. Adding to the chart of protein needs, we can insert the recommendation from the 2021 Critical Care Guidelines. That recommendation is 1.2 to 2.0 grams per kilogram per day. Generally speaking, critical illness represents the highest protein needs of all disease states. I'm anticipating that Aspen and the Society of Critical Care Medicine will update their recommendations for subsets of this population like burns and obesity soon, and I'll make a new video on it when they do. Until then, thank you for watching this video on protein needs.
Make sure you check out all of the other videos in this series, and let me know if there's any other topics that you'd like me to cover.